the success that we're going to achieve and we are achieving is as a result of cooperation, collaboration, bringing people together to accelerate cures for spinal cord injury. Since his Man in Motion World Tour 25 years ago, Rick Hansen has nurtured a dream of true collaboration across the spinal cord injury care field. That dream began to be realized in 2003 when the Rick Hansen Foundation established the SCI Solutions Network, now the Rick Hansen Institute. Today, the Rick Hansen Institute brings together individuals and organizations committed to improving outcomes for people with spinal cord injury through research, infrastructure, knowledge exchange, and the identification and implementation of best practices. The Best Practices Implementation Program is working to create a bridge between research activities and clinical care that will allow frontline medical professionals to take advantage of recent research discoveries. The goal of the Best Practices Initiative is to affect the changes in clinical practice necessary to achieve the best possible health outcomes for Canadians with spinal cord injury at every stage of their journey, from acute care to community integration. One example of how research discoveries are being translated into clinical care is in the area of autonomic dysfunction following spinal cord injury. Autonomic dysreflexia is a complication which occurs in people with spinal cord injuries at or above the level of T6. In other words, it can occur in all quadriplegics and in paraplegics who have loss of sensation at or above the lower rib cage. Autonomic dysreflexia occurs when an irritating stimulus is introduced to the body below the level of spinal cord injury, such as an overfull bladder. Overactivity of the autonomic nervous system causes an abrupt onset of excessively high blood pressure and can develop suddenly and is potentially life-threatening. If not treated promptly and correctly, autonomic dysreflexia can lead to seizures, stroke, and even death. It is a condition that only presents itself in relation to spinal cord injury and therefore is not known to most physicians. Dr. Andrei Krasikov, a clinician scientist with international recognition in the area of autonomic dysfunction following spinal cord injury, is trying to change that. Dr. Krasikov's research is specifically focused on investigations of mechanisms underlying debilitating cardiovascular and other autonomic dysfunctions that are commonly observed in individuals with spinal cord injury. My colleagues in Canada and in U.S. working on developing of ABC course on autonomic dysreflexia, which will train nurses in emergency room, emergency room physician, family physician on life-saving procedures. What to do with person with spinal cord injury with situations such as autonomic dysreflexia. The first time when person with spinal cord injury experiencing autonomic dysreflexia is a horrifying experience. The level and severity of spinal cord injury will predict occurrence of this condition. The higher level of spinal cord injury, the more frequent occurrences of autonomic dysreflexia and present itself as an abnormality in blood pressure control with autonomic dysreflexia arterial blood pressure, systolic blood pressure can go up to 300 millimeters of mercury. Extremely high. It's excruciatingly painful. And it could increase in a few seconds. Elevation in arterial blood pressure is not only troublesome and unpleasant for person with spinal cord injury, there are numerous evidence from the literature that they result in a very serious medical complications that vary from developing of seizures, intracranial bleeds, strokes. Some individuals develop the attachment of the retina or bleeds inside of the eyes. There are a few 
death reported as a result of autonomic dysreflexia. In my clinical practice, I saw one of the young individual with very healthy heart developed myocardial infarction because of prolonged vasoconstriction due to autonomic dysreflexia. Very important to recognize that any stimuli which for able-bodied individual, sometimes very benign, such as slight pressure on your, in your shoe, tight shoelace, which for me will be totally benign. For a person with spinal cord injury will be very, very irritating and could result in uh, autonomic dysreflexia. There are many symptoms related to autonomic dysreflexia that can make diagnosis of this condition difficult. Careful evaluation of individuals with spinal cord injury is an important step in identifying autonomic dysreflexia. Some individuals will describe symptoms very clearly. That's why we describe symptomatic autonomic dysreflexia. And they will describe this as a pounding, excruciating headache, palpitation in the chest. They will describe sweating in a forehead or above the level of the injury. They will describe they will have a goosebumps. They will have a flushing of their skin above the level of injury. They will describe they have a pale skin below the level of injury and cold, clammy extremities below the level of injury. I sustained my spinal cord injury uh, in 1982 in a bi BMX bicycle accident. Uh, I was 15 at the time. Um, uh, basically, a, a bunch of us were taking turns jumping a bike over a, a ramp, and I, I was unfortunate enough to fall off the bike and break my neck at the time. Just a freak accident. Initially, um, a lot of my instances of autonomic dysreflexia were very hard to pin down on what exactly they were. And the first time I had a really bad experience with autonomic dysreflexia, I actually had a situation where my, my vision actually went black which everything just faded to black, which was a very scary experience. Just a very uh, sense of not being well uh, is basically the only way I could explain it. Just knew something was wrong, but had no idea what it was. I started having other symptoms very, that were very odd, like numbness and tingling sensations, which they, uh, couldn't identify and I ended up going through a number of tests and MRIs and, and whatnot and they weren't able to identify what the problem was. It's not very often that you would have a patient in the emergency department with autonomic dysreflexia but it certainly does happen and the clinicians there need to know how to respond to that. For patients when they come to the emergency department or when they're in the operating room or the urology department or wherever they might be within our system that there, there is a standard of care that they can expect to receive. They found out that I was actually having trouble with my bladder draining properly. And once we dealt with that, then all the symptoms abated. It took approximately five years to actually diagnose that I actually had problems with autonomic dysreflexia. Let's talk about diagnosis and management of autonomic dysreflexia. Following the initial Measurement of blood pressure. First step, unbutton the tight constricted devices such as belt, shoelaces, and sit up patient in a wheelchair or in a bed. By sitting patient up, we will automatically decrease blood pressure in order to already manage autonomic dysreflexia. Following this initial step, measure arterial blood pressure again. If blood pressure didn't change, check urinary bladder. Urinary bladder, about 90% of causes 
is a trigger for the autonomic dysreflexia. It could be blocked catheter, it could be urinary tract infection, it could be stone. And then depends on this condition, you will make decision either just empty the bag of the patient or provide the passage of the urine from the bladder because just by emptying the urinary bladder sometimes will treat this condition immediately. If these three steps were not successful, if the blood pressure still continued to be elevated above 150 millimeters of mercury, you have to start to think about implementation of pharmacological measures. In our hospital, most commonly we use nefedipine, or next measure is captopril. Some hospitals will also use nitropaste as a treatment of autonomic dysreflexia. And then, if this were not successful at home, then patient has to be considered to transfer to the emergency room. The most important recommendation to my patients, to their caregivers that I and my colleagues giving all the time, knowledge is a power. Education about autonomic dysreflexia is a life-saving tool. Now that I actually know the symptoms to look for, I know the precursors that to happen first and I can uh, uh, I aggressively check my blood pressure um, to make sure that I can keep a track keep ahead of things getting out of control I always recommend to my patients have cards in their pocket this is these cards devised by either Paralyzed Veterans of America or BCPA and there are other versions of these cards for the introduction of autonomic dysreflexia. And this hopefully will help to introduce this condition and management of autonomic dysreflexia to medical personnel who never saw this condition and never knew what to do with this condition. It is not surprising that the diagnosis of autonomic dysreflexia is often missed. Therefore, it is essential for every person with spinal cord injury to know how to recognize and treat the condition. We believe that this is definitely life-saving first step for our patients.